Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Awesome. Um, thank you for joining us for the last session of the day. Uh, we will try not to keep you from the uh, booth crawl that comes after this one um, and be on time. So um, today we will be talking about the open source ecosystem and um, challenges, good things, bad things, and all experiences that hopefully all of us share in this room. So um, before we dive into the talk, let's um, quickly introduce ourselves so you, you know who, the, who your speakers are. Uh, my name is Ildiko Bancha. I am Director of Community at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Um, as you can see on the slide, I have a bit over 11 years of open source experience. Um, it started when I was working for Ericsson and I was working on their um, cloud execution environment project, which was based on OpenStack, which happens to be an open source cloud platform. And uh, a bit over 11 years ago, I didn't really know what that really meant beyond just understanding the words themselves. And then as I learned a bit more about the concept, the community and the ecosystem, I realized that this is something that I want to stick around. And eventually I joined the Open Infra Foundation where I focus on more the angle of collaborative software development um, as well as community management and those sorts. Um. And I'm Phil Robb. <clears throat> um, I've got about 23 years or so in open source. Uh, started in 2001 at Hewlett Packard. Um, ran their open source program office until 2013 when I joined the Linux Foundation. Uh, Linux Foundation was starting a bunch of networking projects like Open Daylight, OPNFV, ORAN, ONAP, and so forth. Uh, oversaw the running of those projects and then joined Ericsson in 2019. And now I work with Ericsson trying to uh, build out open source strategy uh, as well as uh, help them with compliance and all things open source. Um, I find that my experiences in open source, uh, there are some that are good, there are some that are bad, which is kind of why uh, Ildigo and I started this podcast. Um, I guess I'll also mention I'm a board member of the Linux Foundation, as well as the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Um, and so we want to talk about, um, about open source and people's experiences. With that, I'll hand it back to you. So again, before we dive into the talk, uh, we also want to know who you are. So we have a few questions uh, that will hopefully keep you engaged and wake you up if needed, if you're jet lagged like I am. Um, so are you using open source, whether in your personal life or the company where you're working for? Like, are there any products that are based on open source that your company might be releasing and, and selling? Or are there any tools that are open source within the company uh, that the company and you are relying on? So who's a user? I would hope so at this event. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so it looked like quite the entirety of the room. So um, of all of you, who thinks that you're aware of every single open source library bit and piece in those open source things that you're using? Any takers for that one? Okay, we got wow. roughly three brave people in the room. <laughs> Um, so if I make statements that are floating around these days that say 80% of, uh, of global software infrastructure is open source and there are other large numbers in terms of investments and revenues and millions and billions of lines of code, um, any of the three of you changed your minds? Still brave. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Now, um, so we established pretty clearly that everyone in this room is aware that you are using open source software in some shape or form at some part of your life. So with that um, baseline, what do you think about your role in open source? Um, who's an open source contributor? Okay, that's what? Over two thirds, it was close to, or I don't least, know, 90% of the yeah. room. Good, good, good 80%. Amazing. So of you who are, who are um, participating in any community and, and contributing, uh, who is a maintainer? 
there's still like, what, a third, almost half of the room. Amazing. Thank you all for, for joining us, and hopefully we will, hear, we will have a little time to hear from you um, about open source experiences. Anyone in the room who's working for a company and whether or not you yourself uh, are a contributor uh, who's working with or managing teams who do contribute to open source projects. Ooh, amazing. That, that was also one third-ish of the room. I love that. Um, are there any um, roles in open source that, that I haven't listed that people feel should be on this list? Shout it out. Release manager, testing infrastructure, translator. marketing, translator. There's nice. a good one. Documentation. Documentation. Community manager. OSPO. Okay. Governance. Governance. I love that. That one, that one is always tough. Okay. So, um, we have a room full of people who are not just aware of open source uh, code and, and projects uh, exist, but also know about how to get involved, participate in, in projects, or work with people in companies who, who do so. So, um, Diving a little bit further into the open source ecosystem, uh, we wanted to still dive a little bit into what this whole open source thing really is and what opinions are out there about open source. So anyone who's not familiar with the open source definition from the open, uh, open source initiative, everyone's aware. So. Um, just in brief, because our session is also recorded, um, if anyone who's watching afterwards is not aware, um, the link is on the slide, go look it up. The, the main point of the open source definition is more around what you can do with the open source code and artifacts and um, kind of approaching open source from a bit more of a uh, license slash license type perspective. We will not go into what each of the points are in the definition. Uh, it's not really the point of this really short segment. Um, in comparison, I grabbed the other main source of truth in today's modern internet, Wikipedia. Um, if anyone disagrees with me, that's perfectly fine. Um, but um, it is a very popular um, platform where people also collaboratively um, put together um, mostly really accurate information. So what Wikipedia thinks about open source is that it still talks about the license type and how um, the label open source software grants rights to you as user and contributor uh, in terms of what you can and should and cannot do with open source code and artifacts. But uh, why I felt or we felt it important to also put this on a slide is the uh, dimension of how open source code gets created because Wikipedia's sort of de definition or explanation taps into uh, how open source software is developed in a collaborative and public environment. So you can see, and again, people who are watching afterwards um, offline, that open source is more than just what it is as a license slash a license type. So we cannot really uh, talk about open source without talking about the people who make it a reality. So uh, going a step further now, we can dive into the, uh, the ecosystem, which uh, if you remember back of all the big numbers and everything, you can, you can see and probably experienced yourself how open source is going through or has been going through kind of a big boom of massive growth and, and adoption and excitement and all the things that, that come with, with any sort of a kind of a hype um, that open source has been climbing through. And you probably, if you're, many of you are actively participating, um, also you probably run into some challenges, either in the communities where you're involved or in the companies who either decided to get involved or maybe they decided to just uh, fork the project 
uh, and do all kinds of bad things that you're not supposed to, and not because it's, the, it's a bad thing to do, but you're actually harming yourself. Um, and that's where, like, recognizing all the challenges and also good, bad patterns and behavior in the ecosystem, um, Phil and I decided that we will dive into this through the experiences that the people have, and we started a podcast. So this session, after a very long intro, um, we'll be diving into uh, what we've learned so far uh, from talking to people with various ways and amount of time being involved in the open source ecosystem, and we will share our findings as of yet with you, and then we will continue adding uh, to those findings as we are moving forward. Yeah, we, we found, and, and I've certainly found over the 20 some years that I've been doing this, that open source is a license type. Every community is unique. It's its own culture. Um, it has its own norms um, and it has its own expectations. And I've seen communities such as Linux, which I always have considered the gold standard as far as how uh, developers, maintainers, committers, uh, everybody participates. Uh, maintaining a level playing field, uh, keep it simple, technology is the thing that's the most important, um, are some of the fundamental principles of that culture. They don't necessarily say anything about an open source license. That's the way that collaborative environment works. I've been involved in other projects where Nobody understood open source to begin with, and so they kind of started making stuff up on their own, and I started having users making requirements with no developers for other developers in a community to, to try to satisfy, and that didn't go so well for some reason. Um, so I've seen a pretty broad spectrum of success and failure in collaborative development that if you just all called it open source, one would think that that's open source. If your only experience was one of those projects that didn't work so well, then that's how you think open source works. And it didn't work so well. Um, if you're in another project where there's strong collaboration, there's a clear level playing field, there's a way to escalate issues, the issues are always focused on serious technical things, you work through the personalities through also going through those discussions and having that conflict resolution. You know, there are great ways to have a collaborative environment in an ecosystem, and there are ways that are a challenge. So I'd like to hear, you know, it, it, later what, what we're going to ask, so be thinking about it. You know, what are your experiences? Have you had great experiences? Have they all been great experiences? Have you had things that were a challenge? What worked well? Why did it work well? What didn't work? And what was the cause of that? So as, as Ildiko and I, as she mentioned, as, as we were discussing this actually in a board meeting of the Open Infrastructure Foundation, that these differences in collaboration uh, are important and they're important to the success of the community. Um, and it's the people in those communities that make or break that. And your expectations going in are important. So being able to share what those good experiences are and things that maybe didn't work so well would be something of value. And here's the uh, the one, only one shameless plug that I will, <laughs> I will do here. Uh, because this podcast is for all of you. We are not doing this for ourselves. Uh, we would like to provide value to the to the ecosystem. So check it out. If you like it, give it a subscribe, a like, reach out to us or leave comments below episodes. Let us know what you liked about it. Let us know what you didn't like about it. Let us know why you found it valuable or why you didn't so we can make it better and more valuable to all of you. And um, one little interesting thing, we do have an exercise. Um, at the end of each podcast recording where we ask people to say open source is and whatever the first thing is that pops into their minds. And as you can see from the word cloud, the two most commonly used terms slash phrases is license type and community. And you can see how much bigger community is uh, compared to the, the runner up license type. So. Um, that kind of what open source is to, to all of you. 
And with that, let's dive into all of our learnings. And we have a segment on community view, and we also have a segment of corporate view, because we do recognize that, you know, we can talk about um, open source in the sense of individuals working on things and sharing things that, that are in interest to them um, and talk about community uh, is really, really important, but also need to recognize how the commercial um, ecosystem um, and industries are relying on open source and companies, corporations also need to understand a bit more about the ecosystem than just lawyers looking at the licenses. So we do have a, a corporate view of open source as well. Now, um, the first thing, not in any priority order, um, single vendor projects. Um, you've probably seen, I've seen kind of an uptake in having more and more projects where there's either one company who's, who's there or, or one dominating company. And sometimes they try to put some effort into building a community around the project and sometimes they, they really just don't. Open source can be a marketing term, it can be a sales term, it's like uh, my customers wanted open source so we just threw the code out there. And um, having single vendor projects, it's not against the law. Um, however, when we talk about the, the community experience and the, the value of uh, developing software in a public and collaborative environment that goes way beyond just the ability of putting the open source license on your code. And that can build a lot of misconceptions in the ecosystem. So this is where things like education kicks in, like all of us who have an understanding of open source, uh, helping others who may or may not see the full picture about what open source is and what else um, they can benefit from just beyond, again, being able to use the label open source or uh, talking about open source program offices. I think there's a whole track dedicated to them at this event. Um, that is an organization within especially larger companies that can take on this role of um, educating the organization. Now, you can also hear that these days, OSPOs are kind of being somewhere on the disappearing end with all the layoffs and everything, let's try to make sure that they don't disappear because they have a very important role to play. Yeah, and it's not to say at all that single vendor projects are bad. It's just trying to understand the intent of that project early on if you're going to engage in that community. One of my favorite references for this was um, Rackspace when they launched OpenStack. Back in 2010, big thing. It was going to be a huge project. I never saw so many companies dogpiling onto it. Um, and they had total control. They had all the committers. They had you know 90% of the, of the contributors. Um, but they were actively engaged in trying to build a community and to open that up and to make them less relevant as the leader of the project. We would go to an OpenStack event and the head of Rackspace would stand up there and say, in this release, 86% of the code was written by people from, from Rackspace. And then the next time they would come, they would say, 74% of the, of the code base was done by Rackspace and we're happy. Next time it'd be 57 and we're happy, right? He was actively saying, we're losing control of this project and we're happy because that means other people are writing code and we're going to make this a successful community. That was the intent of Rackspace. They were extremely explicit about it, and they needed to be. Otherwise, they would not have gained the trust, and that project would not have gained the mass appeal that it did, and it dominated for a decade. And it's still around going strong. Actually, it's in a renaissance right now, um, which is really kind of cool to see. But uh, that was an important aspect of that company's engagement with their community, making a very clear statement on their intent, and actively driving to, to make it so that others could come in and work on that community. I would argue, I think Valky is going down the same path, right? As small number of companies, we're here to build a community. We want to continue to make this a very much a community-based project. There's an intent there. So juxtapose that with an organization that doesn't want to take your contribution to an open source project because it conflicts with their proprietary product you know, direction. That's limiting to the community. It's going to make it so that it's hard for a community to grow. 
that organization can do that, but you as an individual need to recognize those characteristics and decide, is that community going to serve your needs, both as, as, as a participant um, as well as a user? And there is another um, variant of the single vendor project dilemma, which goes as far as, as it's called the bait and switch model, where it's not just a single vendor project, but um, the company who launches the project at one point sometimes do decide to change the license on that open source project and say that now it's source available or business source license and the variations of all these things. And this is even more harmful than just innocently failing at, at building a community um, around your open source project, because this is something that puts fear into those who don't have the open source experience. So how can someone trust an open source project? Because, you know, the license might be different tomorrow. And that is harmful to the community, the ecosystem, users. It is really harmful for everyone. And yet, this is an actual business model, if you ask some VCs. Now, um, there are some examples on the slide, and you can see that there's the Elasticsearch that then sort of became OpenSearch as an example of how the community and ecosystem finds a way, like just because the license was changed, you can grab the very last version of the fully open source code, take it and create a community around it if that's what you want. No one can legally stop you from doing that. Uh, if again, you take the last open source version, which did happen in the, in the past. This is how open search became to exist. This is how open tofu became to exist. And the, uh, the question mark with Elasticsearch and open search is that I think it was what, three weeks ago or, or something along the lines when Elasticsearch is now a GPL and there's a blog post or announcement somewhere that Elasticsearch is open source again. I have no idea what that's going to mean down the road. Uh, but it definitely puts a question mark on like how viable this business model actually is. And I personally, that is my very, very personal opinion. I really don't know what Elasticsearch is trying to get out of that moving back at this point, but I am more than excited to find it out. Yeah, and, and public forks have been um, around for a long time, long before the, these rug pulls have been happening. And it's just... It is the safest mechanism that I've ever seen in any technology development where if the leaders of a community aren't serving its constituents, the constituents can pick up their marbles and go play someplace else, right? And that's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great equalizing factor. It's one of many great equalizing factors about the concept of collaborative development within the open source sphere. I mean, we're seeing it play out substantially, I think, right now. But it's not, it's actually not new. Okay, in the interest of time, we will probably run out of it <laughs> as we go. Um, let's jump forward. Um, license type. We talked about the open source definition a little bit. Um, and we also wanted to highlight the, the license type conundrum just to really highlight that um, licenses are, are theoretically straightforward, but they are not as straightforward sometimes as they look. There are still a lot of misconceptions uh, about open source licenses and the different variants of it. Um, we do have uh, one episode on the podcast with Stefano Mafuli um, that focuses uh, more deeply on, on licenses. Um, so if you need to hear one takeaway, then just remember that all open source licenses are permissive. Um, and um, you can use that as a baseline to, to move forward with them. But the, the point really is that um, you need to be aware of uh, what the implications are of the different license types. Uh, because uh, while they are all permissive, there are some which will require you to do and take certain steps like 
if you have modifications, sometimes you have to contribute that back. Um, and making sure that you are educated on the level uh, of what your um, involvement is can save you a lot of trouble down the road. Um, and we are not even talking about you being a corporate organization who's deciding to open source the project um, and trying to pick a license type that is uh, not just OSI compliant, but it is also a license type that will support their goals and strategies the best within that. Anything to add? All right. Um, and the other, the other angle is um, that we will just kind of stress one more time, uh, not really to people in the room, but probably more people who are watching this offline, um, is that open source is way more than just um, a license type. So it's not it's not free software in the in the sense of free beer and free puppies because none of those are really free things at the end of the day and that is the same with with open source so um, just because uh, we call it free and open source software it, it doesn't mean that you can just take it and um, and do whatever you want with it if if everyone just takes it and no one actually invests time, effort, money, energy into the projects and the ecosystem, then we are not really looking into a bright future. And I don't think that's what we want um, to happen. So um, always remember that license is one thing, but the community and the ecosystem is where you can uh, make a difference and contribute to the success and sustainability of the project and the ecosystem. Um, one thing that you, if you attended the keynotes, uh, you heard of, I think the, the Cyber Resi Resiliency Act was mentioned this morning, uh, probably um, some others too throughout the day. Um, so open source got so mainstream that it got picked up by uh, governments uh, all around the globe, actually. Um, the examples are focused more on Europe and, and uh, US slash North America, uh, but there are other regulations um, defined and, and cooking all around the globe, everywhere, which will affect every single one of us's lives um, just because of questions like who's liable for what, and um, like what happens to open source code once it's picked up by any company and then uh, is being distributed as a commercial part of a commercial solution, uh, how we are relying on uh, code and, and uh, solutions that uh, have open source bits and pieces in it throughout um, every single day in, in our lives. Um, so, um, the fact that governments are recognizing open source is a good thing. Um, however, how they decide to regulate or try to regulate the, the space can be a very bad thing. So this is, this is another area where we all have a responsibility of education to make sure that those policymakers, leaders who make decisions at the end of the day come up with something um, that will support the open source ecosystem to, to keep existing as opposed to something that will paralyze um, everything that we built so far. Um, just a question. So who in the room is um, getting paid at least partially for the work that you're doing in open source? So strong, strong majority of folks in the room. Um, yeah, the, the implications, you know, it's for me, I find it interesting because I think we've come to the conclusion that open source is one. Again, 80% of the code base in pretty much any given piece of software that you're running these days is open source. Um, those that are developers uh, recognize that there's pretty much anything that you can find out there that functionality wise that you can pick up to actually put into your code. Um, the problem that we've run into is that now everybody that is a bad actor out in the planet recognizes that open source is one really big juicy attack vector um, from many different angles, right? And that's causing the regulatory bodies to start to regulate 
software, particularly commercial software that's using open source. And for all of those companies that are employing all of us, um, that means that they have obligations that they're about to start to do. Um, that all ties back to these communities, how they work, how healthy they are, how they can be sustained, and so forth. Um, so just to paint the picture that, it, that a thriving community, one that works, one that actually has the investment necessary, is now going to be regulated <laughs> to an extent. Um, and you know, we're, we're looking at two years before um, the Cyber Resilience Act comes into effect. Um, but it is now that I know many in the room are working actively inside of their companies to begin to address what that means. Um, and it's something that, uh, I, again, I, we, we want to make sure that everybody here in this room is aware of as well. And then at one point, we will reach out to you and want to hear about your experience with it <laughs> and turn it into a couple of podcast episodes as well. Um, security is something that we can't really not talk about. Um, the, uh, the highlight that I, that I want to make is, um, I mean, we all understand how cybersecurity is something that we all need to just be more aware of just because of how uh, digitalized our life um, has become. But on the other hand, for someone who's not fully familiar with, with open source um, on most levels, like if you're doing a simple Google search, open source software is the most secure and the least secure within the first two hits in a, in a Google search, which to you all and we all in the room it doesn't really mean anything because we understand how the open source ecosystem works for the most part. And we have some level of understanding of what to look for, trying to figure out if a particular project has any security related measures in place or not. But for someone who doesn't know much about open source, um, I mean, do you just walk away at that point with believing the first or the second hit? Um, and how will that be damaging to the decisions that you that you make afterwards? So um, these headlines are really not helpful. Uh, we all um, know again how important security is and and how many steps have been taken and have not been taken yet in the open source ecosystem to address security concerns. Um, but this is the uh, another time to. Um, to mention that on one hand, if you are participating in an open source project, then uh, if no one has talked about security there yet, be the person who brings it up. And on the other hand, um, those of you, again, who are working within companies, uh, talk to them about um, how security is being addressed in the projects that where you are and the company is involved. and what you and, and your company can do to help the community to, to take additional measures um, in this space. And uh, we'll run through this section um, real fast to make sure to try to stay within time and then have a chat with you all, maybe if we can squeeze that in as well. Um, so this is something that um, we've still um, seen and experienced in, in, our, in our chat with people that when you say contributor, most people associate to code developers. Um, which is not really accurate. Like even just the the things that that you all listed um, at the beginning of the session, like the um, people who are involved in governance or doing community management. I mean, community managers don't necessarily have to be employed by a foundation like how I am. Um, so that is that is something to um, as a function. It's really important within a community and. Um, as a community manager, you don't really have to write code to be able to um, provide a lot of value to the community and, and a lot of um, support to help them to, again, become successful and, and sustainable on the long run. So um, it is kind of a heads up to, um, if you're involved in a community, uh, help people who would like to get involved, whether or not they want to write code. Um, and also help spread the word around that contributor does not 
require anyone to write code because it's not the only way to um, invest your time, effort, energy, money me meaningfully into uh, into a community and project stash the uh, the overall ecosystem really. And we will ask this at the end of the session. Um, let's dive into the corporate view uh, real fast and uh, see what's there to unpack. Yeah, so um, I've spent most of my career explaining to leaders in, in large companies why open source is important to them, how they need to behave with it, um, and explaining how this very unintuitive environment works uh, because it is rather unintuitive to most business leaders. Um, conversely, I spend a significant amount of time talking with open source developers and open source projects about the motivations of companies and why they seem to behave sometimes irrationally or against their own best interests when working with open source ecosystems. Um, so that that function is um, is something that I find uh, to be quite fascinating and has again led me through my career uh, for the last 20 25 years um, in the end I've come to the recognition that trying to balance out when you're doing 80 percent of your code base being open source um, having a development split that goes somewhere between 80 percent of your uh, product development team is focused on that differentiated advantage. 5% is focused on those open source ecosystems that you rely upon the most. And that's not doing features, that's doing all of the other stuff. That's reviewing other people's code. That's uh, being part of the release team. That's being part of the testing team. That's doing documentation. Um, all of those things that we take for granted often um, as organizations who are using open source. Um, you know, I find it interesting that the open source ecosystem always seems to want more. Right? When I started this, the, the, the argument was open source is cool, you should use it. Right? And that was, that was back in the early 2000s. And then it was, well, you found a bug, so you should at least report the bug. So, and then it was, well, you shouldn't just report the bug, you should fix the bug and, and put, a, put, a, put, a, put something up there. And then it was, well, you should add the features that you're adding to your own version, you should put upstream. And that was the next thing we pushed the management to do. And now it's, well, you're putting so many features upstream, we need somebody to review those. The poor maintainers are, are, are overworked. So you're always wanting more, right? But to actually create a sustainable ecosystem, that's actually what it takes, right? And it's good that we've gone to this point where 80% of the code base of any given you know, piece of software is, is open source, but we're lacking that 5%. I've been recently looking at the prisoner's dilemma because I find that this actually fits relatively well with what does it take to do a common good. Um, and it's the 5% that's missing because it's the, it's the thing that everybody else should contribute. Right? I'm happy to contribute the features, but to keep the thing actually running isn't my problem. Right? And that's my latest argument with corporate management, is that you know, this is something that's really, really valuable. We've been all getting tremendous value out of the software ecosystem doesn't matter what industry you're in. We've all been getting tremendous value out of it. It's now under attack, again, from all kinds of malicious actors. Um, and there's an awful lot out there. So we need to do a much better job at stabilizing this software supply chain that we're all relying upon. Those are the terms I use when I talk to companies. Very different than what you just heard from Nordico about community and, 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 and making sure that everything works in that manner. But that's the corporate side, right? And that's, those are the things that companies are interested in. We value, companies value our software supply chain. Um, now there's a level of recognition, maybe we need to put a little bit more investment in it. On to finish this slide, so the 5% are working on those things. They are the influencers for your company. The 15%, they're pivoting back and forth. They're either working on product features, if that's what's most important, or they're pushing features upstream, if that's what's most important. But as a division of labor across your development workforce, I think this is a reasonable model or something relatively close to it in those numbers. 
And one thing that I would just quickly add is like the difference of how you're talking about open source. And if you're in a corporate environment and you're trying to talk to the leaders and, and uh, business decision makers and you're using the, let's say, community vocabulary and talk about contributing back and this is the right thing to do and, and these kind of arguments, not going to go very far. And uh, it is a personal experience as well. I didn't get, get very far with that language. It took me 11 years to fully recognize it. And um, yeah, that's something that we all need to talk a little bit more about and like how to talk about open source in business language. And we're, we're seeing a lot of smiles for those that can't see everybody else around them. So mm -hmm. is there a little hands? Maybe this is reaching, is this ringing relatively true to some people in the audience maybe? Okay. Well, a lot of people it seems. Okay. Um, okay, so um, we, we've gone through um, the highlights of what, we, what we've heard from, from people so far um, as we've been chatting with them on the podcast. And the last thing, I'll just let Phil to run through the supply chain points a little bit, and then we will open up the floor. Right. Um, and, we, and we've talked about this a bit before, right? So explosion of open source projects. Oh, never mind. I think we're... Probably. We're out of time. Um, <laughs> maintainer fatigue, abandoned projects, targeted and sophisticated attacks. Again, this is just this is where we are today. Um, and so, since open source is one, since open source is ubiquitous, since it's now this juicy attack vector, um, since now there's regulatory requirements to make sure this is all better in a very short period of time. Two years in the corporate world is a short period of time. Now is when to actually act. Um, that's what we have to do, and I'm going to kind of bring it back to the podcast. These are the types of things that we talk about on the podcast. Ildiko and I use it as a learning experience for us, but also one to share with others. Um, and it's a very interesting time in open source. Um, and I, I, I want to make sure that it continues to persist and continue with the technical excellence, which has always been the underpinning of open source, because the, techni the, the, the best technical solution ends, ends up winning. Um, so anyway, with that, where do you want to go? I think we're out of time, so we can't even yeah, we are, have an interesting are, conversation with the audience. We are out of time. I would just, I would just ask really quickly with a, with, a, with a show of hands, did this talk resonate with you? All right. It looks like that we talked about things that the room has experience with. So um, thank you for participating, uh, attending events and, and coming and giving talks is participation again people who are on the other side of the camera um, that's a reminder to you as well and to those of you who are in the room I think it's booth crawl so we will be around catch us and let us know in more details than a show of hands uh, which part of the talk resonated with you and what are your success stories what are your struggles uh, your learnings um, because we would love to hear about all of those indeed thank you